and get us started. Um, I want to welcome everyone to our webinar hosted by the Drug Free America Foundation, um, supported by the Florida Department of Health. Um, the program today is entitled The Biological Component of Behavioral Health and Marijuana Use, and it's a part of Drug Free America Foundation's Marijuana and Pregnancy Educational Project. Um, my name is Ashley Reedy. I am actually the program manager of um, the Marijuana and Pregnancy Project here at Drug Free America Foundation. And so as we get started, I'm just going to go over a couple housekeeping rules. And like I said, as you'll come in, as you come in, just go ahead and put your name and where you're from in the chat. And then if you want to write any questions you have, if you can put that in the Q&A section, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen, um, that'll be very helpful. And that way, at the last 10 minutes of this webinar, um, Dr. Higgins will do a Q&A for us and we'll pull those questions from um, that area of the Zoom meeting. And so this meeting is being recorded, so you will get a um, recording of it um, sent out via email as well as um, a certificate of attendance as well. And we'll also get Dr. Higgins slides in a PDF format for you as well. And then right when you get ready to click off of this webinar, there will be a survey that pops up. And if you can just provide us with your feedback, it's a really quick survey um, that helps us better enhance these um, me meetings that we have. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our awesome guest speaker that we have today, which is Dr. Evelyn Higgins. Um, she is the founder and CEO of Wired BioHealth, formerly known as Wired for Addiction. Um, Dr. Evelyn Higgins is a recognized international expert in the epidemiology of addiction and behavioral health complexities. As a certified addictionologist and diplomate of the American College of Addictionology and Compulsive Disorder. Ooh, that is a mouthful there, and diplomate of the American Board of Disability Analysts specializing in pain management. Dr. Higgins has had the honor of advising the U.S. Surgeon General, producing and hosting a Gracie Award-winning nationally syndicated health and wellness terrestrial, terrestrial radio program, and serving as a 1996 Olympic team doctor and Olympic torchbearer. And so she has a variety of experiences, and she's going to be sharing sharing um, a lot of that with us today. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome Ms. Dr. I mean, Dr. Evelyn Higgins. Thank you so much, Ashley. It's a pleasure to be here with you, and I appreciate you inviting me to do this today. So as Ashley said, we're here to talk about the biological component of behavioral health and its relationship with marijuana use. So just a little bit about we, what we do at Wired BioHealth. We specialize in the biological component of behavioral health optimization and addiction recovery. So to date, mental health has relied entirely on an individual's ability to communicate the symptoms and a practitioner's subjective interpretation of behaviors. So what if my vocabulary isn't your vocabulary? Where do we wind up? How does that change or skew our diagnosis? And this health inequity is what made us move forward in Wired BioHealth to develop the panel that we use. So as the literature exists, there is no amount of marijuana that's been proven safe to use during pregnancy. According to the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecology, advises against the use of marijuana during pregnancy due to the potential adverse effects to mother and fetus. To me, that seems like a no brainer, but apparently <laughs> I, I am someone who is thinking differently because there are a lot of people that think, well, what's the big deal? The, the, the perception has changed of marijuana because of the legalization in so many places. We're even seeing bud tenders suggesting in marijuana dispensaries that marijuana to a pregnant woman is a good idea to reduce potentially the anxiety or whatever it is that they are dealing with. So that I am here today to talk about as the literature exists and what we can do to make changes. There is no amount of marijuana that has been proven safe during pregnancy. Consens um, consequences in physical, emotional, intellectual health from newborns through adulthood. Newborn, we know about low birth rate, preterm birth, increased NICU admissions, increased trembling, high-pitched cry, the poor adaptation to visual stimuli, and then we go to early school aggression, attention deficits, impulsive behavior, 
impaired verbal, visual reasoning, we're, we're setting our children up for failure when we look at what these, these outcomes really look like. The nine to 12, the pre-adolescence, the same problems that we talked about earlier, as well as now we're looking at things like depression, anxiety, autism, spectrum disorder, learning disorders, psychotic behaviors. Then on to that adolescence and young adulthood with lower academic scores, with problem behaviors, with depression, with psychoses, with that higher risk of using marijuana and a higher risk for developing other substance use disorders. We are setting them up for failure. Users experience new behavioral health concerns due to that evolving THC. So what more can we do? Include technology. As I briefly said, that's why we created the panel that we use. We, we were looking at the healthcare inequity that exists within mental health and within the addiction world, the substance use disorder world. We didn't bring technology into advance where we were. So we, we knew we had to include technology. We make objective behavioral health tools available to providers and to mothers, objective information. We measure with biomarkers, we address the underlying biology that's creating a need to self-medicate to begin with. That's the part that we have to look at. Why do you feel this need to begin with? Educate using objectivity, understand the biochemical pathways associated with behavioral health complexities, including addiction. Focusing less on the how and more on the why can lead to greater understanding of the cascading effect of mental health and marijuana use. And stop dismissing mothers. You're pregnant becomes the answer to a mother's feelings, thoughts, cravings, impulses, rather than recognizing that there are measurable biomarkers that can improve the behavioral health of an expecting or new mother. That your pregnant excuse for everything doesn't work. So addiction is a complex disease. It is not a moral flaw. I did a TED talk, Understanding the Biomarkers of Addiction. And in it, I discussed that, that addiction is not a moral flaw. By definition, a disease is any harmful deviation from the normal structural or functional state of an organism. We're looking at a triangle, a bio, psycho, social, triangle of these three pieces that exist in the addiction space. Until now, that biological piece really hasn't been discussed in any length other than the common um, obvious, you know, make sure that you sleep eight to nine hours a day, be well hydrated, eat dense nutritious food, all of the obvious things to lifestyle behavior, but someone's unique physiology has not been looked at until now. So we look at in, in by the Kaiser Permanente study that came out recently, post-COVID, 53% of Americans are diagnosed with anxiety and or depression. For anyone in the field, you know diagnosed versus undiagnosed is a big difference, right? There's a lot more people if we include the undiagnosed. But that 53% anxiety and depression is incredible. According to the University of Pittsburgh Men Medical Center, one in seven women will experience a perinatal mood or anxiety disorder like postpartum depression or anxiety. And quite frankly, those things just get brushed away. They really do. We could do an entire, we could do an entire webinar just on that. According to Johns Hopkins Medicine, 85% of new moms will experience a postpartum blues. That is a very large number. And then according to NIDA, 80% of individuals with less than 90 days of sobriety will relapse. So according to the National Institutes of Health, half of people with a substance use disorder will develop or currently have a co-occurring mental health disorder. So most often when somebody gets to the point of an addiction, it is due to a diagnosed condition not being treated properly, an undiagnosed condition or a trauma 
or one, two, or all of three of those. There is always a co-occurring disorder underlying someone's desire to self-medicate. Why you need to bring something from the outside to the in inside to change your state of being says that there's something going on. We have to figure out the why. Substance use, abuse, and dependency are often the result of self-medicating, a mental health issue. It's a way to manage initially an unwanted emotion or a thought or an impulse then that creates its own unmanageable co-occurring problem. It works until it doesn't work. Regardless of the form in which someone is self-medicating, they are doing so to find their perceived balance. Where is it that I feel better? And if you look at this Venn diagram, we have mental health on top, addiction on the left, trauma on the right, and all of the parts in between there of what someone is trying to do to reach that homeostasis. They're self-medicating. What's their survival straight? What's their coping mechanism? This is all measurable with biomarkers. So focusing less on the how and more on the why through biomarkers. Why do we even get to this point? So biomarkers and behavioral health, let's talk about that for a minute. In 1936, the chemical synaptic transmission in the peripheral nervous system was discovered, that place where, where all the action takes place. In 1953, the double helix was discovered. In 2003, the human genome was mapped out. That's still relatively new information in science. For that to be disseminated, to the point of practitioners and then to the public, that's still new information. And then in 2008, we looked at the 1000 most important genes for diseases and conditions. In 2014, tail end of 2014, beginning of 2015, is when BioWired Health ability to look at SNPs or polymorphisms within someone's genetic code became possible, the technology to look at that information. 2017, it was only in 2017 that a Japanese physician won the Nobel Prize for understanding the cellular mechanism of autophagy, autophagy being kind of like the garbage man of the cells. In 2020, we created the Wired for Addiction panel. This is still all relatively new information when you get from the human genome on. We are working so fast with this technology. So I mentioned the word SNP, genetic single nucleotide polymorphism. Let's talk about that. Previously, science thought that our genes were static. We now know that we can modify the expression of our genes. That's epigenetics changing the expression of our genes. A SNP, a single nucleotide polymorphism, is an error in the genetic coding. And that can lead to what we call aberrant behavior. What's aberrant behavior? Things, things like risk-taking, impulse control, anxiety, depression, addiction. The ability to measure the level of error is possible by what we do with the technology. We can have no clinical abnormality, which is what we're after, that's great. We could have a heterozygous finding, meaning one in the pair has been affected. We could have a homozygous, meaning that both in the pair have been affected. There are genes that are linked to defects and methylation, really important for gene expression, for that autophagy we just talked about, kind of the garbage men of the cells. We can't have all this dead debris staying within our body detoxification? Do we have the ability to get rid of it? Inflammation. How does inflammation affect our nervous system, that neuropsych piece and others? So SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, as biomarkers in behavioral health. Let's just look at two of these. The SLC6A4, this is gene encodes the serotonin transporter or the CERT gene in common terms. It's responsible for clearing the serotonin neurotransmitter from the synaptic space. And that CERT is the target of many of the therapeutic drugs that exist today. 
the antidepressants, the SSRI drugs. There are many of them, and that's the target area that they're working on. So polymorphisms are associated with an increased risk of anxiety if you have this SLC6A4 or depression. Even less effective response to an SSRI medication. So if someone's been on a particular SSRI medication for years, for decades, which they were never meant to be on for decades, they were meant for acute situations, not chronic situations, but that does exist today. Someone's been on an SSRI for years and they're not getting the results we need. We start playing that game, double it, half it, change it. When, if we took a deeper dive and looked further, we would see that this person had an SLC6A4 heterozygous or homozygous result, and they were gonna potentially have a less effective response to an SSRI medication to begin with. What does that do to someone's emotional state? If you've been on a medication that has been ineffective, you are told quite frequently that it's you. This works, this is what the target is, this is what it does, this works, this is on you. You don't wanna be better. What that does to someone's emotional state is extremely dangerous. And if we took the deeper dive, we would have known that we were gonna have a less effective response to begin with and we should probably choose a different route. Let's take a look at the GAD1 gene. Really important when we talk about someone's behavioral health, be it anxiety, depression, addiction. GAD1 is the enzyme responsible for the conversion of glutamic acid, which is a stimulant neurotransmitter, to GABA, which is a calming neurotransmitter. If we're not able to do that, we're never going to reach that calm state. A deficiency of GABA from a polymorphism in this enzyme, what do we see? It's associated with sleep disorders, with the glass half empty type of personality syndrome with a dysphoria, just could care less about life, even muscular spasticity. But if we talk about someone who is reaching outside of themselves to be it self-medicate or whatever the case may be, sleep is often something that is part of that picture. Glass half empty, just no zest for life is often why someone would be reaching outside of themselves to change where they're at. So these are two really specific biomarkers that can change the trajectory of someone's life. So now let's talk about the neuroscience of neurotransmitters and hormones. Neurotransmitters, these are our brain chemicals. They are responsible for things like mood regulation, for appetite, for focus, for sleep, for pain, for libido, for our drive, be it personal or professional. The reference ranges of these neuroscience biomarkers are based on age and gender. It is looked at through urine, looks at what's bioavailable versus what is pathological. And the speed that it moves at is like a text message. It's right there, fast. Versus hormones, things like DHEA, or cortisol, cortisol being your stress hormone, DHEA bringing the, the precursor to that, or our androgens, our sex hormones. Again, the reference range, they're based on age and gender, and this is done through saliva. Again, what's bioavailable? What is your body breaking down? Not just what is circulating. This speed is much slower, more like a carrier pigeon. So we see the hormones take a longer time to see the changes that in neurotransmitters we can see more rapidly. So neurotransmitters as biomarkers and behavioral health, where do we use them? Things like, let's just use the example of serotonin because again, back to most people have heard of the neurotransmitter serotonin because there are so many SSRI drugs on the market. And there is a sweet spot where your biomarkers of serotonin are most optimal. So if there's high, we see clinical correlations associated with that. If they're low, we see clinical correlations associated with that. When it comes to serotonin, it starts to sound like an overlap. High serotonin can be associated with symptoms of increased anxiety, with agitation, 
even diarrhea or IBS-like symptoms. It's commercialized as the feel-good chemical. So people start to think, well, if I have more serotonin, isn't that good? Don't I have this built-in shield? No, because we have to live in that space of balance. If we have low serotonin, what does that look like? It can contribute to mood concerns, including anxiety, OCD, depression, anger, just a general sense of discontentment. We see anxiety on both sides of that. If someone is expressing vocabulary for what anxiety looks like for them, these words could be switched. Low serotonin is associated with poor sleep, with appetite changes, with chronic fatigue, even rheumatoid arthritis, an overall kind of who cares picture. This is just the biochemical pathways of some of the neurotransmitters we're talking about. So you can see that there is an organized way that our body arrives at what it needs. Example on the left there, when we're looking at tryptophan on top and then serotonin kind of in the middle downstream from that and melatonin. If someone is having problems with their serotonin, with, with uh, mood concerns, with anxiety, with OCD, sleep, you can now see how that would be a part of if we have inadequate amounts of serotonin that our body is making, it's no wonder we wind up with something like a sleep problem. So biomarkers and pregnancy, let's get to the meat of this. So pre-existing suboptimal physiology, perhaps, were you self-medicating before you became pregnant? Were you using medications as prescribed? Was there a family or a personal history of behavioral health complexities before? Rapidly changing neuroscience biomarkers. Your body is now pregnant. The woman's body is pregnant. Androgens, those sex hormones are going to change. DHEA, the, pre, the precursor to cortisol is going to change. Cortisol itself, the stress hormone, is going to change. Those neurotransmitters, serotonin, dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, glutamate, GABA, phenylethylalanine, histamine, glycine, just a few of them. Those are going to change in this woman's body as they're pregnant. Activating the genetic single nucleotide polymorphisms as the genome interacts with the environment. So pregnancy does not exist in a vacuum. Internal and external stressors will impact the physiology and that clinical correlation can create a need to self-medicate if not identified and biologically supported. So we talked earlier about how with these genetic SNPs, the expression of that SNP changes. That's because of the environment. So if our environment is changing, so can the expression of our genes. This can really complicate a picture creating someone's need to self-medicate, if not identified, at what's really going on, pinpointed objectively, and then biologically supported. So feelings and behaviors can be criticized. Objective bio biomarkers can't. That's one of the beautiful things here, right? We identify, we isolate, and we measure the physiological component of behavioral health complexities using a triangular relationship model. So we have the genetic SNPs, we have the neurotransmitters, and we have the hormones. And all of those, we are looking at how they interact together. We look at 85 biomarkers, 69 genes, 11 neurotransmitters, and five hormones. And we see how those are all interacting. So we've got two case studies we're going to talk about. The first one is of a mom, 34-year-old female, first time mom in 2018, and then a mother of two as of 2022. Her health history included marijuana, alcohol, depression, anxiety, and ADHD. Her attempts at sobriety, when her, it was actually her family who reached out to us, and they had said she has tried everything. She herself said, I have tried everything. I have done inpatient rehab. I've done AA. I've done counseling. I've done therapy. I've done medications to no avail. During pregnancy, 
she had anxiety, depression, and her ADHD was really showing itself. She used marijuana to help sleep. She did stop drinking alcohol. So when we looked at her genetic profile, the epigenetic biomarkers, we're looking at these single nucleotide polymorphisms. You see there in that first part, a green, green meaning no clinical abnormality, yellow meaning a heterozygous or one of the genes in the pair affected and a red being a homozygous, both genes in the pair affected. That MTHFR A1298C shows no clinical abnormality. There is a lot of talk on the web about the methylation gene, the methylation gene, and it's expressed as one gene, MTFR. That becomes problematic when we're talking about what I call a recreational test versus a clinical test. You're looking at one gene and saying, I don't have any methylation issue. If you look at the yellows and the reds, extreme methylation issues for this individual, it would not have been addressed at all had we not taken the deeper dive. We look at 14 genes related to methylation. So what about her neuroscience, her neurotransmitter biomarkers? Her serotonin was pretty good for a female of her age. We'd wanna see a reference range between 60 and 125, and she was at 89.8. She was in good shape there, well within limits. Her dopamine, we'd wanna see between a 125 and 250. She was at 220 within normal limits. Norepinephrine, we'd wanna see between a 22 and a 50. She was at 28.9, so she was in good shape there. When we got to epinephrine, we'd wanna see between a 1.6 and an 8.3. She was at a 10, off the chart, off the highest number she could be, high. So elevated epinephrine is associated with the stress response. And it contributes to things like anxiety, agitation, irritability, insomnia, even hypertension. So that piece of, I need to smoke a little bit of marijuana to bring myself down and reduce my anxiety, my ADHD, my irritability, was her trying to self-medicate what's happening with that epinephrine. If we look at the GABA, we'd wanna see between a two and a 5.6 and she was at a 4.3. So not off the chart, but upper range GABA, she had what we would see clinically would be difficulty concentrating, diminished memory, a dampened mood, decreased cognitive processing, as well as fatigue, even decreased exercise endurance, sleepiness and an inability to feel alert. When it came to the histamine, we'd want to see between a 14 and a 44. She was a 12 or off the chart low. So low histamine, we see digestion issues and appetite control. We see learning problems, memory and mood can also result in drowsiness. And then phenylethylalanine or PEA. Normally we would see between a 32 and an 84. She was at a 21 off the chart low low phenylethylalanine, we see things like depression, attention deficits and hyperactivity. We can even see Parkinson's disease and bipolar. When we looked at the hormones under her neuroscience biomarkers, you took four readings during the day when you first wake up, noon, evening, at night, because this follows the path of circadian rhythm. We don't have the same amount of cortisol being put out in our body all day long in its response to stress. It makes sense that we should have the most in the morning when we first wake up and then go down a bit at noon and, and evening and night should be headed downwards because we should be calming down. Look at what's happening with this woman. She starts well out with a 7.3. Then at noon goes down to a three in the evening we'd want to see between a two and a five. She's at a 2.1. At night, we'd want to see between a one and a four. And she is at a 25. No wonder she was struggling. Her body was putting out so much cortisol at that time. 
she that's where her need to self-medicate came in. And we identified that. We, and we look at different ways to then handle that situation. Next case study is a child, five-year-old, when, when, uh, when their parents reached out to us. She was a foster child in Florida and became adopted by the family in Florida. At birth, she suffered neonatal abstinence syndrome, <clears throat> polysubstance situation. Her APGAR rating was a one at one minute a three at three minutes and a five at five minutes. When we're talking about APGAR scores, at five minutes, 89% of the population is now at a 10. She was detoxed in the hospital. She coded twice. She was never intubated. And she went through months of withdrawal. Her behavior, that's why the family reached out to us, because she was in trouble in school by now. The aberrant behaviors of an addict she was showing, focus, mood, sleep, pain. This is at five years old. She was already having relationship issues with other students at school and the teachers. And there was concern of the biological family history, obviously, as well. So our model is test, don't guess. And this is exactly why. When we looked at those genetic single nucleotide polymorphisms for this child, first one that we see there is COMT or the catecholamine methyltransferase. She had a heterozygous result. Someone with a COMT heterozygous result is more prone to prolonged episodes of anxiety, of depression, and OCD. That GAD1 glutamic acid decarboxylase associated with sleep disorders, that glass half empty syndrome and dysphoria, just who cares about life. She had a homozygous result there. The parents reported that even the siblings of this child within the family were saying she was very hard to deal with. Everything was always trouble. It was a downer. It was that glass half empty, that why bother in a child's response that doesn't even know that's how they're acting out. The TPH2, you see there, that's a heterozygous result. That's associated with psychiatric diseases such as bipolar affective disorder, anxiety, and major depression. And that SLC6A4 we talked about earlier, a homozygous result associated with increased risk of anxiety, depression, and less effective response to an SSRI med. So in her neurotransmitters, she had elevated serotonin. We saw increased anxiety, agitation. We saw those in her, those clinical correlations. Normally reference range for her uh, pediatric category would be between a 79 and a 235, and she was at 240. When it came to dopamine, we'd want to see between a 175 and a 500. She was at 598. So elevated dopamine, we see increased worry, distrust of others, decreased ability to interact socially. This is exactly the, the picture of what she looked like in school and at home and is often found in patients with attention deficits and hyperactivity. When it came to norepinephrine, we'd wanna see between a 29 and a 69, she was at 28.5. So hanging on by a thread there, low norepinephrine, we see depression and mood changes as well as fatigue, difficulty concentrating, decreased ability to stay focused on tasks, and diminished sense of personal and professional drives. This was already playing out in this child at five years old. If you were already feeling like you're not it, you're not worthy, you can't bring it together, you are creating the habits for the rest of your life. To me, this is the sweet spot of working with young people and changing their lives so early in the game. When it came to glutamate, she had upper range glutamate. We see things like anxiety, poor concentration, attention deficits, hyperactivity, tendencies, poor sleep, nighttime awakening. All those were true of this child. We're seeing a lot of these words of the clinical correlations being repeated. We had elevated 
GABA we'd want to see between a 2.6 and an 8, she was at a 10. So with elevated GABA, clinically, we see things like difficulty concentrating, diminished memory, dampened mood, decreased cognitive processing, fatigue, decreased exercise endurance, sleepiness, and an inability to feel alert. And this child did have decreased exercise endurance. Her siblings got on her case all the time, like she calling her a slug. But this was real for her because of what was going along, going on within her neuroscience. So when we looked at her cortisol levels, we could see that she woke up okay at a 10. Optimally, I'd like to see between a 14 and a 25, but I can live with a 7 to a 30. She was a 10, but we took a crash at noon. When we look at that optimum range of between 5 and 10, and she's a 1.9, she's already struggling, and she's still halfway through her school day, and she is struggling. In the evening, we'd want to see between a 2 and a 5 in a reference range for a child this age. She was at a 0.66 struggling and then at night we'd want to see between a one and a four and she was at a, a 0.39 her dhea was less than 10 a reference range that dhea which is the precursor to cortisol should be less than 220 she we can see that she was struggling from the moment she came into this world and we can make changes to this this case study underwent testing and biochemical pathway support in phase three of her Florida Department of Education VPK assessment. So this is a third party government standardized test objectively quantifying her learning behavior and her cognitive development. That first one on the left was before her parents came to us to have us work with her. In the middle, we had already started. The one on the right, was at the end of the school year where we had worked with her for a six month period of time. She was doing terrific. Changing the lives through the inclusion of objective testing and biochemical pathway support. This is what it looks like. This is that child that I've just been talking about. Thriving in her home life, academic life and piano lessons. She went on to receive the character award in her school for her willingness to help others and for her leadership qualities. That is totally changing the tra trajectory of someone's life. In addition to that, she is so young in her life that everyone that she comes in contact with is going to be better for being around her. It changed her in school. It changed her as an individual. It changed her in her family's life. So behavioral health equity amongst pregnant population and drug prevention tool in children, pregnant mothers, without testing to objectively quantify the biological component of behavioral health complexities, the symptoms are easily dismissed. They remain untreated and mothers search for means to reduce symptoms contributing to the history of substance use disorders, the reduced perception of harm with marijuana. It's legal, how bad could it be? We've got this false narrative that we're running with. And there's a fear of mental health judgment instead of being able to openly have this conversation and say, objectively, we're going to look at your unique physiology and see what we need to do to enhance it. It's like any other part of healthcare, and it should be discussed that way. Rather than self-medicating to reduce anxiety or depression or a lack of focus or insomnia, testing can determine which biomarkers require intervention. This shifts the conversation from a character defect, mental weakness, and moral flaw to a conversation that's supported by objective biological data that leaves no room for the stigma or the bias. When it comes to children, for children born to mothers with a history of use during pregnancy, who are showing signs of behavioral health complexities, determining the biochemical pathways requiring support, rather than subjective interpretation of behavior or empirically prescribed pharmaceuticals, 
can contribute to the optimization and the physiology and the outcomes and should be used as a prevention tool. So finishing where we started, Focus less on the how and more on the why for everyone's unique physiology. 7.5 billion people in the world, yet we treat everyone exactly the same using tag words. I hope this has helped everyone understand marijuana use, how it happens the perception and the stigma that's still associated when it comes to mental health. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Higgins. I couldn't even get my computer set up correctly because I was taking notes and listening because there was so <laughs> much good information. Um, thank you for providing your um, expertise in regards to addiction and behavioral health. And then we're looking at those biologic components that I think really is very enlightening because like you said, um, we're treating everybody the same and it's like, no, our genes are not the same. They don't express themselves the same. And so I know we do have some questions in the chat and I will get over to those, but I just wanted to tell you how thankful we are for that presentation and how um, informative that it was. Thank you, so, Ashley. My pleasure. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and go into our Q and A. Um, okay. So this first question, I actually had the same question as well is when you have a medication resistant person, how do you get doctors to do these tests and respond accordingly? You know, it's still tough because most physicians don't even know that this science is available. And that's what we're doing every day, trying to get it out there into the public and normalize this conversation and that this technology is available. But have them reach out to us, ask their physicians to reach out to us. We work with physicians, we work with treatment centers, we work with people that are incarcerated. We work with people that need this help and, and getting the conversation started is the first part, right? So ask your physician, hey, reach out to them. And, and we'll help the physician learn how to use this. Yes, and we'll definitely link Dr. Higgins' information um, in our follow-up email to make sure everyone gets that. Um, next. And let me just say, in fairness to the physicians too, Ashley, they don't have the time. You know, they, they're, we all know what healthcare is today. You have, if you're lucky, five minutes face-to-face -face, because the next five minutes needs to be paperwork. And they don't have time to go out and learn new things. Fair. Well, and as I said, in the whole map of how we came through the science, this is still new information. It takes time for people to learn to think new ways. Yeah, that that's one. And I appreciate that grace in that perspective. So we don't go being upset with the doctors. No, no, not at all. Not at, everybody's trying to do what they can do. Everybody's in it together. Um, let's see, our next question is, can short term SSRIs help individuals brain chemistry reset? If so, how should a user of SSRIs come off the drug for best and most stable results? Right. So yes, they can. And um, first off, I would say know why you're on that SSRI. And is that truly what you need? Because mm -hmm. even when we're just talking about depression, it could be serotonin, it could be dopamine, it could be epinephrine, it could be norepinephrine, it could be one, two, three, four of those. So know that we're actually taking the right medication to begin with and then work with your physician and titrating off. Thank you. Never and this, go cold turkey. Yeah, th this was like a triple question in one. So, but I, I broke them up for you. <laughs> Thank you, appreciate it. So um, they're saying to explain methylation, methylation one more time. Okay, so methylation is involved in our gene expression. It allows our body to detoxify. It allows our body to absorb nutrients. So it is a really, really important process that needs to go on in our body every day. And if we are not methylating, we're not gonna detoxify properly, which is a normal process of the body. Every day, if we are methylating properly, our body should detoxify. If we're not doing that, we're going to have a buildup of toxins, be that from the environment or be it from medications or substance use, misuse, or even a prescription that is a valid prescribed drug for you. 
If you're not methylating, these can become toxic within our bodies and create neuropsych conditions. Mm -hmm. So a very important process and something to, to know whether you're methylating properly or not, because it can be, now we take action steps to get you to methylate properly. That's part of the expression of your genes. If we have a methylation gene that is heterozygous or homozygous, we identify that. Now we say, okay, let's come up with a plan to get you methylating. Wow. I didn't know that was a thing. So thank you for whoever asked that question. Um, this was the last part of that question. And I'm sorry, Miss Debbie, I'm going to butcher all the information that she put <laughs> in this question. But also, can you talk to us about how worried we should be in public health about the increasing numbers of people going on ayahuasca journeys? I worry it has potential to completely scramble a person's brain chemistry, pregnant or not, when issues were not that severe. What do you think? Hopefully you know what I was talking about. <laughs> sure, yeah, I do. Um, I find it problematic because for a lot of the people doing it, they haven't identified in the beginning why they would choose to go that route. Do you objectively know which one of your neurotransmitters or your hormones are problematic? Do you know going into that what your genetic profile is, where we have any errors in the coding in the areas we talked about? So that trip, I'm going to call it, that journey is going to look different for everybody. And no two people having the same makeup are going to be affected the same way. It could really turn somebody upside down. So there's so much talk now, just like you know, all of the talk that came before the legalization of marijuana, we're looking at it. We're going to see the downward effects of that. I liken it to when smoking was okay. And then years later, we're like, who thought that could have ever been a good thing? You know, that's what we're doing with marijuana now. Well, we're looking at all these other areas the ketamine experience, the ayahuasca experience, all of these other experiences people do, people are looking for because we are at such a time of behavioral health and mental health downshift, right? When I talked about that number, 53% of the population being diagnosed with anxiety and depression, we bring in all the people who are undiagnosed, we're looking at a really large number. So it shows us that there is a need for people to have better mental health. How do we get there? It's not doing the one-off situations. It's not. It really isn't. Start with objective information. Know what you're made up of. Talk to somebody who knows how to work through that. Because you will wind up having the best experience of your life when this works correctly and you're living in balance. That will be the best you showing up. Mm, thank you for answering that, Dr. Higgins. That just goes back to that test and don't guess concept. Um, yeah. yeah, I like that. I think we have three more um, questions here. So someone wanted to know how much do the biomarker test cost? Um, you can go to our website, wiredbiohealth.com, wiredforaddiction.com. That information is on there. You can reach out to us. Depends on what test we're looking at for you after you tell us what's uniquely happening to you. These are all personalized. This is truly the next era of, of, era of what we're doing in health. It's personalizing for someone's unique DNA. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. And we'll um, send out the links to all that information as well in the follow-up email because I don't want to, I don't want to get lost in the chat. <laughs> Okay, our next question is, what are natural ways to increase or decrease each one of the neurotransmitters? So good question. Um, there are like the obvious lifestyle things that we talked about getting in the sun, and especially first part of your day, that first 10 minutes when you wake up, being in the sun to get that flowing is the best way to start. But look at how most of us start our day, we roll over instead of looking at the sun, we look at our phone right? So that conversely does just the opposite. Um, sleep, any of the normal parts of our day, laughter, happiness, joy, finding those things in our life and saying, bring all of these into my daily rituals. 
is going to enhance all of those neurotransmitters working better. Perfect. Perfect. Um, let's see. I think this may be our last question. So if there's anybody who has any questions, drop those in the Q&A. We've been answering majority of them and I'm down to one. So is your testing some similar to um, RDS, reward deficiency syndrome testing? Where can we refer our clients to get the testing? And I think you'll probably say the website, but. <laughs> yeah, we're doing a lot deeper dive than the RDS. This is looking at much more of a complex picture. Um, and again, the websites, wiredbiohealth.com, wiredforaddiction.com, have a conversation, tell us what's going on, and we point you in the direction, but it's it's bigger than, it's more inclusive. Perfect. Okay, Dr. Higgins, I have not seen any more um, questions come through the Q&A just yet, um, but maybe we'll give everybody another couple seconds. And we'll get ready to be mindful of everyone's time and close out our webinar today. But thank you again so much, Dr. Higgins. This is such helpful information when we think about all the different things that are going on with marijuana and pregnancy and marijuana in general, but also behavioral health as well. So thank you so, so much. Um, Heather, is there any questions, anything that you wanted to mention? No, it's an extremely powerful presentation. I learned a whole heck of a lot. And we really do thank you, Dr. Higgins. Thank you. It's been a pleasure working with you guys. Perfect. So we will send out um, a recording of this webinar as well as a PDF of Dr. Higgins um, PowerPoint. And we will also send out um, the attendance certification. So um, without further ado, thank you everybody for joining us on this webinar. And I hope that everybody has a great day. And remember to take your end of a webinar survey if you can for us. But everybody have a good rest of your evening. Thank you. Bye.